Welcome back to episode 15 of Money Equals M Squared. My name is Mike Torello, and I'm here today with our guest, Rick Gorell from TrainRx Performance Programming. And we're gonna be talking in about dialing in your nutrition. So Rick, Rick, thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Mike, thanks for having me, really appreciate it. Awesome, so Rick, before we get started today, we're gonna to talk a lot about nutrition, what works for people and what they should be focusing on. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got started with this? All right, so back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I was extremely into sports, you know, kind of training, things like that. I'd spent a lot of my high school career, um, you know, playing a lot of sports, so I was working out really hard all the time. I took that into, you know, college, and then after college, I just stuck with it. It was something that really interested me, um, so I just kind of ran with it. Um, so I went to college for sports management, which it's not a very uh, common you know, bachelor's degree, right? But to give you an idea of it, basically it's a combination of being able to run some kind of health and fitness facility with a little bit of kinesiology mixed in, right? So you learn how, you know, the muscles work, how to do this, how to do that, that kind of thing. Um, so when I got done playing collegiate baseball, when I graduated from school, I went right into coaching baseball. I worked at a baseball academy, right? And I had guys who were, you know, seven years old, just getting out of T-ball, all the way up to pros. Um, for anyone who might be familiar, there's a, uh, there's a guy on the Arizona Diamondbacks. His name is Christian Walker. I actually played with him when I was growing up, but then I had the, you know, the privilege to you know, work a little bit with him while I was at the academy. So I saw a lot of different you know, athletes while I was there. And towards the end of my time there, I started really gravitating towards strength and conditioning. Right, because that was something that I noticed everyone really, really needed to succeed. Right, so I was able to work with the strength and conditioning at this academy with a lot of the high school kids, with a lot of the college athletes. Um, you know, we trained pretty hard a couple days a week. We had some very specific programs that we went with, and I got done these programs after these kids would get through it, and I realized, oh, I like this a lot more than coaching baseball. So I I stopped coaching baseball. I went and got you know my first training certification. I started studying up as much as I possibly could. And then I got a job at a gym. I started working in the health and fitness industry. Um, I did that for about seven years. And while I was there, probably right in my fifth year, I started my own business. And that's what I'm doing now. So now I own TrainRx Performance Programming. Um, what I do is create, you know, workout programs for people all around the world. You can access, access them via an app on your smartphone, super easy to get. Um, you know, along with that, I work with people with their nutrition, um, just kind of making sure they're doing what they should be doing um, in terms of eating appropriately to reach their goals. Um, so that's, yeah, that's uh, pretty much what I do now. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds a lot like this was something that was a build off of your previous passion, right? Like you said, mm -hmm. you played collegiate baseball, that was mm -hmm. your passion. Yeah. Training, fitness, nutrition, all became, that's part of that passion. You wanna play baseball at a high level, you wanna play any sport at a high level, you have to have all that ready to go. Mm -hmm. And now you turn into a career and you really love what you're doing. Exactly, yeah, that's spot on. It's perfect, so mm -hmm. why don't we get right into our first question here. We're just gonna ask you, you know, a few things about things people should focus in on. Let's talk first with you know, constructing a meal. You know, what sh how should you build out a meal? What types of foods should someone be looking for, you know, to get through their day? This is, I'm gonna make this as simple as I possibly can because it honestly is so simple and everything has gotten so messy nowadays with, you know, you hear things on the internet, on the news, um, but in reality, it's so easy. So to start, you really want to avoid anything that is highly processed, or if it can live on a shelf, say in your cabinet for years on end, stay away from it. Just don't go anywhere near it because it's not going to be a good option, right? So that leaves us with things that were once alive or grown somewhere in a field, right? That's really what you want to focus on, right? So I like to tell people to kind of categorize things into protein, fats, and carbohydrates, right? So you have your three macronutrients. Within those three macronutrients, you're obviously going to have options, right? Those options, they're, they're pretty important, right? Um, like I mentioned, we wanna to stick to the things that were alive or grown in a field somewhere. So it's gonna be a pretty limited list, but it's gonna be really good for you. So for example, for protein, 
I'm always going to recommend that people have, you know, things like chicken, ground beef, ground turkey, uh, canned tuna is a great option because it's really, really quick. Uh, beef or steak. If you have those things on hand, pretty much at all times, you're going to have your protein needs covered. Uh, you can go with a protein powder, you know, if, if you know that you're gonna be you know, tight on time or something like that, protein powder, it's gonna be just fine. Uh, but you wanna eat something that was once living. That's gonna be your best bet. Now, when you're focusing in on those proteins, you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, chicken, ground beef, ground turkey, canned tuna, stuff like that, steak, would you prefer one over the other or would you list them all as those are the good proteins, pick from one of those five, you're gonna be okay? <laughs> Those are the good proteins, yeah. If you pick one of those, you're gonna be just fine. You know, you wanna have some options, right? You wanna um, avoid the monotony of constantly eating chicken. Right, you don't wanna have grilled chicken every day mm -hmm. and, and that's the only thing that you yeah. can eat. Yeah. Nobody can handle that. It's, it's extremely boring. So having a couple options is really good. Um, that opens up the door then for your fats. Right, so every meal that you eat, you know, you need to have at least, you know, you need to have one of each of these things, right? So fat is an interesting one because the, the quantities are very small, right? So what I like to tell people, if you're gonna have healthy fat, extra virgin olive oil, butter, those two are great. Everyone thinks butter's bad for you. Butter is not bad for you. It is, it is actually very good for you. Uh, those two are the easiest. Then you can go into things like avocados. Right? A lot of people don't see avocado as a fat, more so a fruit instead, but because of the higher fat content in the actual you know, food, we're gonna put it in the fat category. And then you can go with things like light cream, um, sour cream, you know, things like that. Um, salad dressing, if you're making it on your own, is appropriate you know if you want to go with a vinaigrette that's fine but anything like a creamy ranch or, or you know a, <laughs> like a mayonnaise based dressing you might want to avoid uh, but the fats pretty simple um, extra virgin olive oil butter you know avocado you know you can do mayonnaise but it, it can be tough well you know and it, it's interesting you mentioned that too right like the avocado one is is interesting right yeah. because like you said most people look at that as a as a vegetable mm -hmm. right yeah. you know it looks like a vegetable it looks mm -hmm. like a fruit right yeah. it looks yeah. like something you're just gonna have a piece of but mm -hmm. it's it's highly you know highly concentrated in fat mm -hmm. but the extra virgin olive oil and the butter like you said those are things people look at as as no goes but you need to balance that into the meal that you're constructing and it's not fake butter it's butter exactly right you know yes. it's not it's not canola oil mm -hmm. or you know some highly processed like margarine oil margarine or something exactly like you're yeah. talking extra virgin olive oil and butter two mm -hmm. very simple basic things mm -hmm. but are good fats for you to put into your body exactly yeah so you know just kind of going off of the fact that it is simple you know when when i explain you know just kind of like the foods that you know we should be eating or that we should be prioritizing it's almost like we're eating ingredients more so than we're actually eating, I guess, meals, right? For lack of better terms, right? We're just eating ingredients that would go into a bigger meal without turning it into something that, you know, a chef in a Michelin star restaurant is going to create. Like you don't have to be a professional chef to figure this out. Like right. it, it's really that easy. Awesome. So you mentioned, so we've talked fats, we talked proteins carbohydrates now we need carbs so this one is always the one that upsets people a little bit right because i'm gonna start off just by telling you right now the the pastas the rices you know things like that they're not bad for you but you have to limit your consumption those are the things that can really really add up in terms of calories so if you're not watching how much of those things that you eat you're gonna be in a bad place. You know, bread, pasta, bagels, you know, anything that's, you know, a real grainy carb, you have to be careful. As far as carbs go, I really like to promote fruits and vegetables. And I jokingly say this all the time, but how many people do you know who have become overweight from eating a lot of fruit and vegetables? Right, exactly. That's not mm -hmm. something people say. We were just talking about this, mm -hmm. you know, kind of preparing for this. Mm -hmm. and, I, and you said that quote, and you're like, who do you know that's overweight from eating too much fruit? <laughs> you know, nobody. No, nobody, right? Yeah, yeah. And and you think about that, and it's and part of it is I don't think anybody puts fruits and vegetables in your carbohydrates. 
but you're putting it there because of the, the sugars and the energy, correct? Exactly, yes. And this is why people, you know, I'm sure you've heard this, and I'm sure someone who's listening right now has been told at some point in their life that the sugar in certain fruits is bad for you. Right. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. It's naturally occurring sugar. It's not bad for you. It's not what's going to make you overweight. Right, so you know you have tons and tons of fruits and vegetables that you can choose from. Um, you know, I like to keep things really easy. Right, if we're going to go for vegetables, things like broccoli, cauliflower, peppers, all sorts of colors. Right, red, green, you know, uh, yellow, orange, whatever you want, that's fine. Um, green beans, you can go with black beans; they're good too. Um, the the vegetable list just it goes on and on. Right, for the the items that are less preferred, so to speak, because these are still vegetables, right? You're, you're looking at potatoes, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, red potatoes. You can eat them, but you just have to be smart about how much you consume, right? I don't want you to sit down at dinner right, and eat two or three whole <laughs> sweet potatoes. That's going to be overkill, right? <laughs> right. So you just need to be aware of how much you're actually consuming. For, um, you know, for, for your fruits, same thing applies. You have an just a massive list that you can choose from. Grapes, strawberries, actually any berry is really gonna be a fantastic choice. Bananas, oranges, you know, apples, all of that, it's great. You know, you can load up on those. And to be totally honest, fruits and vegetables, eating a lot of them is really hard. You know, if, if you look at the serving sizes that you're supposed to eat, right, or if you're trying to hit a certain amount, the, just the quantity of say strawberries or the quantity of broccoli it's huge it's there's so and, much of it and that's why you know if you're focusing it on your fruit and your vegetables and you're focusing on those quantities you're going to get full so much faster right exactly. you're going to eat you know white bread or you're going to eat you know um you know those bad carbs for you like you said, like pasta, you can eat so much pasta. It doesn't fill you up right away. And you're hungry 30 you're, minutes after. Exactly. You're mm -hmm. burning that. You're, you're immediately hungry and it's not doing anything for you. Where berries, how many berries can you really eat before you're, you're stuffed and you mm -hmm. can't do anything else? And it's going to keep you full, right? It takes up a lot of space in your stomach. It's very satiating. Um, so, yeah, so those are your carbs, right? And it, it's probably a little different than what, you know, a lot of people were expecting to hear because it wasn't based solely off of the grains right because right? when we hear carbs we think grains we think bread Exa pasta, exactly rice, yeah that kind of stuff now i'm not saying that you can't eat it right like i mentioned you just have to be aware of how much you're consuming and then what it makes you feel like afterwards now vegetables this is one thing i've always wondered we're, we're building our plate out we you said if you grow it in a field it's good mm -hmm. we don't want stuff on a shelf what's your thoughts on canned and frozen vegetables versus fresh Canned and frozen, just fine. You know, um, it's not easy to maintain fresh fruits and vegetables. It's really hard because you have to eat them, you know, two, three days or they're going bad. I mean, I bought six bananas, what, today's uh, Tuesday, I think on Friday, and three of them right now are basically mush on the top of my fridge just because I haven't eaten them, right? So, you know, fresh ingredients or fresh fruit and vegetables, they go bad quick. So if you need to buy frozen, totally fine. Um, it's going to last longer and you're always going to have it. Right. And which that's what's important. It makes it easy, right? That's this yeah. thing like, like for me, like I have three kids, right? Mm -hmm. Fresh ingredients running around. What can I do quick and healthy? Frozen vegetables, frozen fruits, mm -hmm. canned, canned vegetables. That's going to help out a lot. Yeah, it's going to be extremely beneficial. I'm, I'd be lying to you if I went and told you I went to the grocery store and bought a head of raw broccoli. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone buy a head of raw broccoli, <laughs> right? You just... You, Buy the frozen bag. It's just the same. It's great. Yeah. You don't have to worry about boiling it, then cooking it. You know, it's just a it's lot just easier. There. It's just easy. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Perfect. Moving on to our next question. Let's talk a little bit about alcohol. You know, obviously it's summertime. People want to go out. They want to have a good time. How does alcohol derail your plan or affect your plan? <laughs> so alcohol is, it's wildly problematic for anyone who is very serious or actively trying to lose weight. Um, and the main reason is because alcohol is metabolized differently by our body than the other fuel sources, right? So our body uses carbohydrates and fat as a fuel source. Those are the primary fuel sources that our body wants to use all day, every day. The second alcohol enters your body, it no longer uses carbs or fats as fuel. It starts using that alcohol as fuel. 
and it's going to use that alcohol as fuel until all of it is gone, right? So depending you as an individual, like who, who you are and how much alcohol you've actually consumed, you're looking at anywhere from 12 to 36 hours where your body is only using alcohol as fuel. Everything and else you eat, everything else that's in your body, getting stored as body fat. So, right. So essentially what you're saying is, so, you know, a night out drinking mm -hmm. can set off uh, somewhere between a day to a day and a half of now everything that you consume, you're storing. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. So it's, it's really a compounding effect, right? So you think about a normal weekend, right? You go out on Friday night, say you go out to dinner, you have, you know, two, three beers. Okay. So you've got however long that's going to take for your body to utilize that alcohol or metabolize it. And then Saturday afternoon comes around, you hit the golf course, you have four or five, six beers with your buddies. So now you're just adding on even more time. You're just prolonging the process. Sunday comes around, okay, nothing. You don't have any alcohol. Well, you're still burning what you consumed on Saturday and Friday. Monday comes around, maybe you've got a work dinner. Okay, you have two drinks there. So there's really no time where your body can start utilizing the other fuel sources, right? So, you know, if we're trying to lose weight, our goal is to utilize stored body fat, right? But if, if we have alcohol in our system, we're never going to be able to utilize that stored body fat. You might for a small period of time, but it's not going to be sufficient enough to really see consistent, you know, actual weight loss. Right. So then you're going to start you know, storing those, that body fat, you're not going to be burning it off. And then instead of losing weight, you're going to put on weight and then you're going to get frustrated, right? That's where people get frustrated mm -hmm. because they're going to be following what exactly what you said on constructing a meal, mm -hmm. but they're having a couple drinks at night with their friends and then they're putting on weight instead of losing weight. And they're going to say, this meal plan doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it happens all the time. Um, which it's, it really is a shame because people do so well when it comes to actually eating and then they totally sabotage themselves by how much they drink. Um, you know, I saw this a lot back when I was working in a gym. You know, we'd have, um, you know, members coming in and I'd be talking to members all the time about their nutrition. And where I was working, um, it was in Pennsylvania, right? On a, on a just very, very upper, you know, class. People were very wealthy. They did a lot of just extravagant things all the time. And with that came a lot of drinking. So you have these people who, they had their diets under control. They were great, but they were drinking six days a week. And they were upset that they couldn't lose five pounds. And it's like, well, I don't know what to tell you. You need to cut back on the alcohol. Um, so it really boils down to, you know, are you willing to cut back on the amount of alcohol you consume? Or are you just going to keep beating your head into a wall and you know do really well with your diet and keep on drinking and not make any progress. You know, I don't want to say that you can't lose weight and still drink because it's possible. It's just going to be much, much slower or ultimately paused for longer periods of time. Right. Awesome. All right. Perfect. So let's take a quick break. We'll head into our community spotlight and we come back. We'll have a, just a couple more questions for Rick. Welcome to this week's community spotlight, the segment of our show where we focus in on the small businesses in our local community. This week, we're focusing in on TrainRx Performance Programming and today's guest, Rick Gorl. At TrainRx Performance Programming, they focus on the most effective training strategies to help guide you towards real results. From exercise selection, total volume, to overall intensity, it's all here for you on easy-to-follow programming. With eight different programs to choose from, the TrainRx Performance Programming platform is one of the largest online training platforms out there. No matter your age, gender, goals, or level of experience, the TrainRx Performance Programming platform has what you need to get the results that you want. Again, that's TrainRx Performance Platform and today's guest, Rick Gorl. You can get in touch with Rick online at trainrxfit.com or by emailing him at info at trainrxfit.com. Welcome back to episode 15 of Money Equals M Squared. I'm here today with Rick Gorell from Train RX Performance Programming. Uh, before the break, Rick, we were talking really about alcohol and constructing meals. Let's talk about kind of why that works now. So first, let's dive into a lot of people like to go on diets. Intermittent fasting is one of the things that's popular right now. You know, it's the newest fad diet, if you will. Let's talk about 
how do you feel about fad diets? You know, do they work? What do you think about them? So, you know, I, I personally, I'm not a huge fan of fad diets and that's mainly because they're not sustainable. Um, they work for a short period of time, right? You, you start a diet, you're extremely excited. You are, you know, just head on, I'm getting after this. You do it for three weeks and then it starts getting really, really hard because you're so limited, right? Or you're, you're eating such few calories that, you know, just normal tasks become very, very challenging because you're not nourished enough. So yes, they're going to be extremely effective for creating a caloric deficit, for putting you in the environment to burn stored body fat, right? But you can't maintain that. So that's why I find them to be problematic. Um, you know, what we talked about earlier with the you know, construction of a meal, right? Using specific you know, food items and things like that. You can consider that a diet. You really can. Um, but that option becomes far more sustainable than cutting out everything and only eating you know, 1,000 calories per day. So I'm not a huge fan of, of the fad diets, uh, but if you need to follow one to create a caloric deficit, fine, that works. Do it if you have to, just understand that you need to maintain it. Right, I think the, the thing that a lot of people don't realize about the fad diets is the ones that have an end date, you know, do this for three weeks, do this for a month, and you'll lose X amount of weight, right? Like that's, that's the pitch that they all give you. You're probably gonna hit that goal, but now you gotta get back into regular life, and you're probably gonna give some back, you got to ease back into it and kind of knowing how to construct to keep your deficit because if you don't hit your goal and then some in that month or month and a half, whatever you're doing, you're going to be back at your starting point right away. And I mean, myself personally, I've seen, you know, with myself, with other people, you go on the, the fad diet, you lose a bunch of weight, you get below your target. And then the next thing you know, you're heavier than you started. Because once you start putting it back in, you can't stop. And you don't want to go back on Because like you said, you feel terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really the main thing. Like, you know, you, you get on the diet wherever you start at. You lose a bunch of weight. And then when it's over, no rules apply anymore. It's, it's a free-for-all, right? Because you were so deprived from the things that you wanted while you were on the diet. You know, and obviously the things that you want are usually the poor choices. The pizza, the wings, the beer, the burgers, you know, uh, stuff like that. So you just go overboard on consuming all of those foods and then you wind up you know, heavier than you were before you started the actual diet and you have to do it again, but you don't want to do it again because right. you know how hard it is and how, you know, how miserable it was. So it just boils down to the fact that it's not sustainable. Right. You should be capable of going back to say correcting your diet in order to achieve the results you want, if you do happen to go off the rails. Because let's be honest, everybody isn't going to be perfect all of the time, no matter who you are. Yeah, and you gotta allow yourself to not be perfect. And I, 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 I see that a lot, is like a lot of people, they, they go on, they're so strict, but they're not gonna allow themselves to be imperfect. Um, you, know, you go on vacation, treat yourself, right? Exactly. Like, you know, like we were yeah. talking like, you know, before, alcohol is not the key to losing weight. Well. Don't try to lose weight when you just paid to go on an all-inclusive vacation mm -hmm. because you're going to be miserable a few ways, right? You're not going to be enjoying your vacation. You're not going to feel you got your money's worth. And you're going to have this massive uh, you know, deficit where you're not going to have the energy you want to do stuff. And so don't do it then. Right. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, but allow that for yourself. Allow yourself to be able to say, okay, I'm taking this week off. And then let me tune back up, right? It's mm -hmm. not crash. It's just tune back up, get right back on track. Yeah, you know, it's like a roller coaster. You know, if you, you look at it on a on a, a chart, so to speak, there's gonna be peaks, there's gonna be lows, there's gonna be everything in between. You know, some day or some periods of time are going to be much better than others. And it's how you recover from those times that are bad and get yourself back to the good. Um, you know, if you can recover from it, you're going to be just fine. And, you know, and weight loss kind of works that exact same way, you know? So if you are trying to lose weight, you're going to have periods where, yes, you're, you're down, you know, two, three pounds every week, sometimes maybe even more, but then the very next week you might be up two pounds 
Right. But you can't let that deter you from continuing to do, you know, what you were doing. And, and that's kind of like how a vacation is, right? You, you could theoretically, you know, be trying to lose weight for a vacation because most, most people want to lose weight before they go on vacation, right? Yep. You're going to the beach, you're going somewhere awesome, right? And you want to drop a couple pounds, right? So you do all this stuff, you know, uh, you know, a month or two prior to vacation, then you go on vacation. Well, that vacation is just one of the little valleys, right? That's a low point. As soon as vacation's over, you just start climbing right back up. You correct what you, you know, just went through and you get right back on the train. But you should be able to get back on the train. Yeah. Because if you can't... Then, it has to be a train you can get back yes. on. Yeah. Because if you can't get back on it, then it's, that, it's a slippery slope. It's just going to keep on going downhill. Right. Awesome. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, you know, you've mentioned the word um, caloric deficit a lot, the term. Can you kind of explain like what it is, how does that work in your body and stuff like that and why it's so important to be able to maintain that in order to do things like just be healthy, lose weight, stuff like that? So from anything that we've talked about, this is probably, in my opinion, the most important thing for anyone to listen to, especially if you're trying to lose weight or even just, you know, maintain a healthier lifestyle, right? Because as soon as we overconsume, we start seeing problems. So to maintain a caloric deficit, it's very simple. All you have to do is burn more calories than you consume on a daily basis, right? So in just as a general statement, the normal person, and this is without doing any physical activity, this is you wake up, you stay completely still in bed all day. You don't do a single thing. You will burn anywhere from 1,300 to 2,000 calories just to maintain your existence, just to live, right? So when we do things like you know exercise or you know walk the dog or run around with your kids, anything like that, you're obviously you're, you know you're using fuel, you're burning calories. Um, that just adds to the ca- the caloric expenditure right throughout the day. But the problem is we're going to eat, right? We're going to consume foods. We're going to put calories back into our body. And the only way to make sure that we're not putting too many calories into our body is to understand how much we actually eat, right? So if you go overboard on the eating, you're going to put more calories into your body than you burn on a daily basis, which leads to problems. So to maintain that caloric deficit, we just have to make sure that we don't put more calories into our body than we burn on a daily basis. Um, So realistically here, that requires some kind of knowledge to what you're consuming or what you're burning, right? Now, figuring out how much you burn or how many calories you burn per day is a lot more difficult than figuring out how many calories you consume, right? You have smart watches or, you know, fitness trackers and things like that, right. but you can't rely on those that much. They'll give you some very good information and they'll tell you, okay, I burned 500 calories in, you know, on this workout or uh, I went for a 30 minute walk and I burned 250 calories. It's going to be close, but it's yeah. not going to be spot on. Um, it's much easier to figure out how much food you eat, right? You can count calories, which is, it's, it's not super easy. It's a little time consuming, Mm -hmm. but if you don't want to do that, all you have to do is measure your food, which is even easier. And then you don't have to worry about, oh, there are this many calories in one gram of protein or this many calories in 20 grams of carbs, right? You're just measuring serving sizes. Right. So you want to have a little bit of an idea of how many calories you eat. Because if you don't know how many calories you're eating on a daily basis, you're just, you're swimming blind. Mm -hmm. You have no idea where you're at. That's good. Awesome. So, so basically, I mean, your, your tip back there would kind of be just keeping track of how much you're eating, kind of measure your food for your portion sizes on the front end. So that way, you know, right? Like if you're, you know, if your portion size is say eight ounces of steak, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Know what that is, kind of do the research, see where your calories are, kind of figure out what your day looks like with an eight ounce steak as part of your meal. Right. Then if you have to cut, we know go down to six. That's mm-hmm. easy. We don't have yep. to remeasure the food. We don't have to count the calories. It's pretty simple. If I go from eight to six, it's an easy cut. I cut a little piece off. I know where I am. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's much easier to reduce, you know, the, a serving size. And that's, that's essentially how you figure out, you know, how much I'm going to need to consume to maintain this deficit. Uh, you know, you can literally do it on a week by week basis. If you know that, okay, I was having uh, an eight ounce steak, I was eating a six ounce piece of chicken, you know, just you name off all the food items you eat, you know, 
every day throughout the entire week and say you gained four pounds. Well, I overate. So now I need to cut these portion sizes, right? right? And then the, the following week, you might see, okay, I lost three pounds. Let's keep the same portion sizes. Exactly. And then maybe you drop another pound or two. And then you just stay with that. Right. So, so if you keep your activity level the same, mm-hmm. keep your calories the same, and you're losing weight, you should continue to lose weight when you have your hiccups. That's why it's important to know what caused your hiccups. Is mm-hmm. it more food? Is it alcohol? Is it lack mm-hmm. of you know lack of exercise or lack of activity? And you're able to kind of pinpoint where everything is because it's all just a mathematical formula, really. Basically, yeah. So you know, Mike, the the really really important thing, right, with this caloric deficit. Okay, you want it to work for you. So while you're in a caloric deficit, the the way it works in your body is because you're not using carbs or fats that you've just consumed, right? Because that's, if you think back to earlier in the podcast, those are our two main sources of fuel. So if you don't have immediate, you know, fats or carbs to pull from, your body has to power itself with something else. So that's going to be stored fat. This is where the caloric deficit starts to work for us, right? So if we're burning stored fat, we're losing body weight. Because that stored fat is going to yep. be converted into energy down to the cellular level, right? Right, because that's where that's where everything happens. So that's what we want, right? So if we're in that environment where we're in a caloric deficit, we're burning stored body fat. We're ultimately going to lose weight. To add to the caloric burn, right? A lot of people in- introduce exercise, right, to their daily routine, and this is awesome. But the exercise that you do is actually far more important or there's certain types of exercise that is far more effective right. than others, so to speak. So let me ask you a question. If, if you're you know, trying to drop 10 pounds, right, what kind of exercise would you gravitate towards? So for me, I mean, kind of knowing what I know, you know, athletic background, I'm always going to gravitate towards weight training, <laughs> Good. right? Yeah. It's going to, you know, I know for myself, it's going to get my heart rate up higher. It's going to stress my body more, mm-hmm. which I know is going to burn more calories. <laughs> exactly. Good. You gave me the right answer. That's what I was hoping you were going to say, right? So, so you, but know I know, what, but I know what a lot of people are going to say. A, ex- lot, a lot of people are going to say they're going to do cardio, right? They're yes. Gonna, they're going to hit their bike, mm-hmm. especially like we're kind of coming out of it, but that the Peloton craze, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's jump on the bike, ride the bike, go for a run. Right, and you look at, and when you look at bike riders and runners, they're extremely thin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they probably didn't start at 300 pounds and say, "I'm just going to start running," and that's how I'm going to get down to you know 130. Exactly. Right, yeah. like that's their lifestyle mm-hmm. that they're in, and I think like you know, like we know we we from you know our experience, you got to build it through the weight training because mm-hmm. the cardio, it's you're just not burning enough calories. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. So, you know, like you said, most people, if they want to lose weight, they're gravitating towards the cardio, the running, the cycling, the stationary bikes, um, or they're going to the, you know, the high intensity, you know, uh, fitness facility right. that's 15 minutes down the road. They're doing a 30 minute workout that is quote unquote high intensity, which is all relative to what you actually do. So you might go in there and and work out for 30 minutes, but it might not really be high intensity. So those are the things that people are gravitating towards, right? And they're easy, okay? you, You don't have to think about it. More often than not, you don't really have to try that hard. So it's, you know, the obvious choice, right? Especially for anyone who doesn't really like to exercise. Exactly. You know, yeah. It, it's, right. it's just if, you, if, you, if you don't like working out, it's a lot easier to put your headphones in and go for a run mm-hmm. than it is to go to the gym and plan a weight based workout. Exactly. You know, yeah. it's going to take, could take the same amount of time. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's could take the same amount of effort. You're still going to feel tired when you're done. Yep. But what did you actually stress on your body and what, what point did you get to? Exactly. And that's, and that's where, you know, I want to bring this back into that caloric deficit, right? So, so if we put aside the cardio, the high intensity training, and we focus on real strength training, real resistance training, the stress that weight training applies to our bodies down to the cellular level, right, is going to be more effective for continued caloric burn throughout the day in comparison to going for like, you know, a five mile run or hitting your 30 minute, you know, high intensity class. And the reason behind that is because our cells need to recover. Right? They have to recover from the stress, from the physical adaptation that you're forcing 
from the weight training. When you go for a run, you're not putting any stress on your body at all, right? Yeah, it's hard, right? Because you might be running for long distances. Right. Or for long it's hard from it's really hard from an aerobic level. Exactly, it's, it's your not, aerobic it's not, fitness. It's not hard from your your physical, your muscular fitness. Yes, yeah. So so you're gonna recover from that run relatively quickly, right? You might finish a five mile run, you know, sit on the couch, drink a water bottle or two, you know, grab a bite to eat, and then maybe an hour later, you might feel like you could go for another five mile run. And if you feel like that, I challenge you to go back squat really heavy, go home, drink a water bottle or two, hang out on the couch, and then walk yourself back to the gym and try and back squat heavy again. You can't do it, right? Because your body has to recover. And that's, that's it right there, that's the key. In order to recover, your body has to consume oxygen, right, at the cellular level. To consume that oxygen, your body needs fuel. Where's your fuel coming from if you're in a caloric deficit? It's coming from those stored fats, that stored fuel, right? Yes, that, stored that, body fat. And that's how you're going to lose weight. Mm-hmm. It, it's better than being on a fat diet. And yes. it's really, and it comes back from if you're eating right, like we talked about at the beginning, you're building up those deficits with those healthy fats, healthy carbs, and you're kind of going from there. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you know, if, if, you're gonna, if you're going to introduce any kind of exercise to aid in the process of weight loss, you're better off doing strength training. Um, it's, it's just going to be far more effective. And even if you don't like it, as soon as you get the hang of it, you're going to find that you're going to feel better. Everything, you know, just your quality of life in general will benefit from it. Things are going to get easier. Um, it's gonna be easier to, you know, lift things up, you know, put stuff down, right? That's right. all lifting is, yeah. right? Um, but, but it's just going to improve your, your overall quality of life far more than regular running, or the constant beat down of a high intensity class, you know, right down the street. Um, but you know, if, if you do that, you pair the strength training with your caloric deficit, your caloric deficit will work for you. And that's what you want, right? You want to make it as efficient as, and as effective as you possibly can. So if you're recovering hard, you're going to burn more fat. Awesome. So I think that wraps, wraps us up for today. Um, big thanks to Rick Gorell for coming on today. This wraps up episode 15 of Money Equals M Squared. As always, make sure you check us out online at lltwm.com. Check us out on Instagram at Team LLT. And Rick, where can people find you on Instagram? So you can find me at TrainRx period performance programming on Instagram. Um, you can even find me on TikTok which is the same exact handle, uh, TrainRx period performance programs. Um, Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Mike. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily the views and opinions of Satera Investment Services. Any recommendations mentioned in this episode are meant for educational purposes only and should not be construed as advice or personal recommendations. Always consult your financial advisor, tax advisor, or attorney for details related to your specific risks, goals, and objectives. Investments have risk and can lose value. They are not FDIC insured. The situations presented are hypothetical to illustrate key topics and should not be construed as actual client situations or experiences. Lagus Lucas and Torello Wealth Management operates under Satera Investors and is responsible for the production of this show. All views and opinions are solely that of Lagus Lucas and Torello Wealth Management. You should always obtain a prospectus when available prior to investing to know your risk, costs, and fees associated with the investment. The advice and strategies presented today are general in nature and should not be used in your planning until you consult with your attorney and CPA on your specific situation. A diversified portfolio does not assure a profit or protect against loss in a declining market. Asset allocation is an investment strategy that will not guarantee a profit or protect you from loss. Satera Investors is a marketing name of Satera Investment Services, securities and insurance offered through Satera Investment Services, LLC, member FINRA SIPC, advisory services offered through Satera Investment Advisors, LLC. Satera is under separate ownership from any other named entity, 127 Washington Avenue, second floor west, North Haven, Connecticut, 06473, phone number 203-239-4545. Individuals affiliated with this broker-dealer firm are either investment advisor representatives who offer only investment advisory services and receive fees based on assets or registered representatives who offer brokerage services and receive transaction-based compensation or both an investment advisor representative or registered representative who can offer both types of services.